Um, I'll begin by saying I was a little worried about putting this title up. When we originally proposed it a long time ago, I thought, oh, we'll definitely have the 1,000 patients in by the time I give this talk. Fast forward to yesterday, 9 a.m., 995 patients. <laughs> but then, between 11 o'clock and 4 p.m. yesterday, five new referrals came in. <laughs> and then this morning on the way here, I was walking past the fax machine, and there was actually one more. So we're actually at 1,001 referrals <laughs> as of right now. <laughs> okay, so 1,001 referrals. We just squeaked in there as of today. Let's talk a bit about RTMS, and I want to talk about what we're doing here at, our, at UHN. It's, it's really the, there's been a tremendous demand for this service from the community and elsewhere. CAMH runs a fantastic uh, RTMS program. Jeff Daskalakis and his crew over there were kind enough to train me during my residency and work with me as I got set up over here. So a lot of credit goes to them for helping make this happen at UHN as well. Um, I'll show you some vintage photographs. So here we are in 2011, January 14th. Uh, Peter and I literally painted these walls and drilled holes and stuck all this stuff on the wall. Uh, and you can see the first two patients eagerly <laughs> awaiting treatment here. Uh, here's somebody who's actually undergoing treatment. So around April 11th, we were in full swing. And so we had a patient here who was undergoing MRI-guided RTMS of the standard target in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, we're a research lab, but we're also a clinical service. And we put a lot of emphasis on trying to really be a resource to the community. Uh, we keep our referral process short and simple. It's a one-page referral. Anybody in this room can refer a patient for RTMS. It just takes an MD's referral, uh, same as elsewhere. Uh, and so we will always try and do that. Not only are we doing research, but we want to actually provide service. And, and I think about half of what we're doing is trying to make RTMS the science better, but half of it is also pioneering, you know, what will the blueprint be like when we start building these clinics all over the country? How are we going to get them to see large numbers of people? How are we going to get them to make a meaningful impact on addressing the 200 and 75,000 people in Ontario who have treatment resistant depression in a given year. If RTMS can't do that, then it's just a sideshow. If it can make a dent, then it gets to be part of the solution for how do we fix these people. So that's what we focus on. And that's part of why we've sort of ramped up over the years. So in 2011, we had one RTMS device. Uh, we had no technicians. Uh, at that point, I was doing them all myself. Uh, we had one other staff. So Vanity, who's now our senior RTMS technician, who I believe has done more RTMS sessions than anybody else in the country. Vanity's right there. Uh, she, was, uh, she was working the front desk at that point. Uh, so she's now our senior RTMS technician. She's done probably 8,000 sessions of treatment in the last three years. Uh, we were running about six to eight patients per day. We got about 110 referrals in our first year, and we had about a two-week wait list to get people in. We really wanted to emphasize that two-week wait list. The point of our TMS, if it's going to do something useful for us, is that it's, we're trying to address the access problem. If you have depression, and you're, or if you're a GP with a patient with depression, we're trying to offer an alternative method where you may not have to wait nine months to a year to get in, but we'll try and get you seen quickly. We'll try and get you seen in high volumes. Now, unfortunately, to maintain that two-week wait list has been a fair bit of work. So we're now, we're now up to four RTMS devices. We're adding about one a year just to try and keep up with the demand. One of those is being installed at Alton Health right now. Uh, we have four technicians, all of whom are here right now. So we have Dr. Umar Dar, we have Dr. Sheila Brown, we have Vanity, who I mentioned before, and uh, we have Aisha Dar as well. Uh, on any given day, there's between 30 and 50 patients coming through, and we're up to about 400 referrals a year. So of that 1,001, if you go back to this time last year, there was about 400 fewer than that. <sighs> we are still more or less around the two week or three week wait list, and a lot of the credit that to that goes to the residents who have been coming and doing rotations with us and helping us to just churn through all these new assessments and really try and see people quickly. So thank you to the residents, and thank you to uh, some of the fellows who are coming in as well to spend some time to try and help us stick with that commitment that we will see you in two or three weeks if you have severe and medication resistant depression. So that's what we hope an RTMS clinic will look like once there's lots of these everywhere. We're really going to try and figure out how do you run these things. How do you, basically the care model looks more like a chiropractor's office than a psychiatrist's office. We have lots and lots of people coming through for vast numbers of treatment. Uh, but I want to address what it is that we're trying to do with this. We're not trying to just build a fancy technology here. We're really trying to think about what does the system need, what do the patients need, and how can RTMS be part of actually allowing psychiatry to be something that is more universally accessible, more effective, uh, and more of a genuine solution for people with depression. So I'm going to ask, why don't we have RTMS clinics all over Canada already? In the U.S., there are over 500 clinics all over the place. Uh, and they, uh, they're, they're treating thousands and thousands of patients. In Canada, we have fewer than 25. And 
to understand why that is, I want to tell you a little bit about just the basics of RTMS. I mean, some of you will have heard about this before. Uh, it's actually being used to treat major depression with the first initial demonstration in trials 20 years ago, 1994. Health Canada approved it in 2002, six years ahead of where the U.S. did. The U.S. didn't get around to approving it until 2008. Um, and there's over 500 clinics there, as I mentioned. When RTMS is performed properly, and you have to ignore the meta-analyses on these because they're a little out of date, when RTMS is done in naturalistic settings, the, all the community studies show that you get more or less the same results. All comers through the door, about 50 to 55 percent of people will achieve response criteria, and 30 to 35 people, uh, percent of people will achieve remission criteria. Not as potent as ECT, but uh, easier to access higher volumes, more tolerable and more acceptable. Of my RTMS non-responders, the proportion who are, there are willing to go on to ECT is fairly small. So we have this niche of people who are failing meds but aren't ready for ECT. That's a pretty big group of people, and a lot of them, RTMS can plug that gap a little bit. The advantage is that we don't have any long-term side effects known. Short-term side effects, 95% of people who start a course of RTMS in our clinic make it to the end. You just have to get through the scalp pain and the headache, which are usually strongest during the first week. The simulation feels like powerful static electricity, uh, but the nerves adapt and it gets easier week by week. So 95% of people manage to tolerate it. There's about a 1 in 10,000, I'll even up that and say at most a, a 1 in 1,000 risk of seizure induction, which is comparable to that on medications. If you look at meta-analyses on these, most uh, antidepressant medications carry between a 0.1 and a 0.6% risk of seizure induction. You don't know whether that seizure is going to be when they're crossing the street, driving a car, riding a bicycle, or waiting for the subway. At least with RTMS, if they seize, you know it's going to happen in the chair in a monitored hospital setting. So we do have that advantage. I wouldn't say it's riskier than medications. Uh, in terms of tolerability, when you look at Cipriani's analyses of 33,000 people in medication trials, 25% of people can, uh, will stop a medication trial before the end, and that's in the context of a research trial. Uh, that 5% of people stop RTMS before the end, so the tolerability does seem to favor RTMS. I don't think it's the first thing to start with, but certainly safety and tolerability are the advantages of RTMS. Uh, and that is why it's a good thing to look towards. Uh, in terms of the disadvantages to RTMS, there are definitely several, and these are the ones that we're going to spend most of our time talking about how we've tried to address them. Boom. Conventional RTMS. 30 sessions of simulation uh, can be the length of a course of RTMS. We know people don't get better in five or 10 sessions. When I tell you to ignore the in evidence of the meta-analyses, I have a reason for that. When you look at the meta-analyses of randomized control trials, the remission and response rates aren't that great. But if you look at the studies, they include 56% of the N, 60% of the N is for trials where they only did about five or 10 sessions of stimulation. That's a little bit like concluding about the efficacy of SSRIs based on clinical trials of less than three weeks duration. It's, it's sort of not really meaningful. And it, it, three, two or three weeks might be enough to dis demonstrate a statistically significant effect, but not enough to quantify the maximal effect when you give enough sessions. In naturalistic studies, 26 to 28 sessions is how many sessions of RTMS a person needs. We found the same thing. No matter how you run the parameters, no matter whether you use high frequency, low frequency, left sided, right sided, in the middle, no matter how you do it, it always seems to take 26 to 28 sessions to get maximal effect. So that's what a course of RTMS involves, and that's one of the obstacles. There's a lot of schlepping into hospital, and if you live in Ajax and Pickering, big problem. So that needs work. Second problem, and this is the biggest problem, the standard FDA uh, protocol, it takes 38 minutes to administer one, se excuse me, one session. So you're four seconds on, 26 seconds off, 3,000 pulses. That's a 38-minute session, not including setup time. So you're looking at an hour per patient, and that means that if you've got an RTMS device in your clinic, you're looking at treating maximum eight to 10 patients a day. If that's what you're doing, you could just as well be, you could just skip the RTMS device, hire a really good CBT therapist or, or, a, or a mental health nurse and have them do CBT and pretty much achieve the same effect. So if you're only doing 38 minute sessions, why is RTMS necessarily better than medications? Well, so that needs work. 38 minutes a session is too long. And that's directly contributing to the third big problem with RTMS, which is the cost. RTMS in the U.S., 20, $250 to $350 per session. That's a $6,000 to a $9,000 course of treatment. The cost in Canada, not a whole lot better in the few private clinics that exist. But a lot of that is just because it takes so long. And if we could speed things up, I mean, the costs of RTMS are fixed. Once you've bought the machine, you've got a technician in there operating it. That's the cost of it. Whether you have 50 people a day come or 10 people a day come, there's not that much difference. So shorter sessions would improve access, improve costs, and improve the ability to run more people through and reduce the wait lists. 
So here's the to-do list to make RTMS from a side show into something that actually is useful in the mental health system as a whole. Number one, faster sessions. I've tried to illustrate 45 minutes on there. 45 minutes is not good enough. We need it to be more down to a 10 or a 15 minute session. So that's where the neuroscience comes in. That's where I'm focusing my neuroscience. Responders, right? I mean, here I'm showing at least 50% responders, 48% non-responders. Those are the kind of numbers that we want. Uh, the meta-analyses, as I say, are more like 25% responders and 17% remitters. I wouldn't send a patient to a treatment where only one out of six people is actually going to get to remission, and probably most of you wouldn't either. So we want those numbers to be up. Shorter courses, this is a huge problem, particularly if your patient lives within driving distance. I've got patients who come in from Kitchener, I've got some who come in from Peterborough, one or two from North Bay. If it's a six-week treatment, that is completely infeasible. So we really need to get this down quicker, maybe down to as little as five to 10 days. And furthermore, if we could do this, then RTMS actually gets a whole new role, not just as an outpatient treatment, but might potentially be useful as an inpatient treatment. Putting, people on, putting one of these machines in the ward, if anyone can find a protocol that gets people better in five to 10 days, then the gods of length of stay will become very happy with you. Finally, a predictive test. If you are going to put yourself through all this mess, wouldn't it be nice if we can look at a brain scan or something like that and figure out, is the RTMS going to work for you? Or better yet, since we have multiple varieties of RTMS, is this kind of RTMS going to work for you? Is stimulating the left side going to work better? The right side going to get better? Um, so looking at predictive tests, I had to put this in here somewhere because, as you know, I'm, I'm trained as an fMRI uh, neuroscientist before I went into brain simulation or psychiatry or anything. So we have to somehow see if we can get MRIs to, uh, to be somewhat useful for this. And I'm going to take you through this because they've turned out to be a good deal less useful for the things I thought they'd be good for and a good deal more useful for other things that I didn't think of at all. Let's take these one by one. Number one, what if we can make our TMS into a three-minute treatment instead of a 38-minute treatment. To do that, we have to understand what RTMS's mechanism of action is. And it seems to be, if any of you remember these Kandel and Schwartz diagrams where there's a presynaptic and a postsynaptic membrane and all those NMDA receptors, long-term potentiation, long-term depression, that seems to be the way that RTMS works. Through the synaptic potentiation of corticostriatothalamic pathways penetrating through and projecting to whatever area you stimulate. So do you need 38 minutes to get LTP and LTD? Well, the, the studies say no. If you go down to the hippocampus or cortical slices, you can actually do just a very few number of pulses of theta burst pattern stimulation. Patterns of stimulation that look like little triplet bursts roughly at the frequency of the theta rhythms of the brain. 600 pulses of that administered in 40 seconds will give you robust inhibitory effects. 600 pulses of that administered in about um, three minutes and nine seconds using eight second gaps in the middle, on, off, on, off, will actually have robust excitatory effects. So recently a randomized control trial came out showing that yes, this intermittent theta burst, both of these versions seem to work better than placebo in treating depression and they're a lot quicker. But the real question is not do they work better than placebo, but do they work better than what we're already doing? And that's where the Toronto Theta Burst trial comes from. The funding for this came from the Buchan Family Foundation. This was a nice collaborative effort with uh, CAMH. So CAMH is doing this trial. We decided, so Dr. Dan Bloomberger and I decided to sit down and do this trial together. Uh, There's been a lot of uh, drive. This seems to be a popular project. So, uh, so a, a CIHR operating grant came in this summer to fund it. And now Brain Canada, Jeff Daskalakis' Brain Canada grant has now come through. So a lot of people seem to want to fund this trial. The nice thing is we've already done almost all of it, so I can share the results with you. The reason it costs so much is we're going to do this in 202 patients with major depression. We may opt to take this up to 297. 307 is the largest trial that's ever been done in the history of RTMS. So this is a sizable trial and does have enough statistical power to show whether there are differences of even 1.5 HAMD points in the outcome. Half of those patients are going to get the FDA standard protocol. 37.5 minutes, 3,000 pulses, left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, under MRI guidance, so we know we're not missing the target. Um, and that's exactly what they do in the US. So that's the standard intervention. The other thing we're going to do is the other half are going to be randomly assigned to get 600 pulses of theta burst in just three minutes and nine seconds. The raters are blinded. Obviously, the patients are not blinded. But we also have no a priori assumptions that one is better than the other. In fact, as I'll show you, our preliminary evidence, is there, the whole point is that this is a non-inferiority study. We're not saying that it's better. And here's the weird part. It doesn't have to be better. It just has to be about as good. It could even be slightly less good, and it might still be worth doing. So is theta burst at least comparable 
to the FDA protocol. I'm going to show you the results from this. We've already had 150 people do the study, uh, and we started last September, so recruitment's been pretty speedy. Um, and I'm going to show you the curves of improvement in Hamilton scores over the four weeks of treatment from pre to post. We're still in the blind. This is a blinded study, so all I can do is write down group A for one group and group B for the other group. I don't know which one is theta burst and which one is 10 hertz because we haven't unblinded the study yet and we won't till the end. The good news is it doesn't matter. These are the outcomes. So we have not been able to identify any statistically significant difference in outcomes between three minute RTMS and 38 minute RTMS. Automatically, that means a few things. That means RTMS can be done in three minutes. You can rotate your patients through that room now in 10 minute appointments instead of 45 to 50 minute appointments. Um, that's a five fold reduction in cost. $40 RTMS becomes a distinct possibility. That's 1200 bucks for a course of treatment, cheaper than a lot of alternatives out there. Um, and best of all, it means that in every one of my treatment rooms, instead of six to eight patients a day, I can run 20 or 30 patients a day. So that's how we've kept up with demand. We've got Theta Burst, and Theta Burst seems to be what allows us to use our three machines and yet still treat 30 or 50 people a day. Categorical treatment outcomes, three minute Theta Burst versus 30 minute conventional. Again, we're still in the blind, so I can't tell you which is which, but they look pretty much the same. There's only one problem. Only 20% of people are hitting remission, right? Now that's comparable to what they're seeing in the literature out there. We don't screen out a whole lot of patients. Like this is, we're trying to make, so about 10 or 15% of our patients are screen fails. The rest are community referrals. So these numbers accurate, we think accurately reflect what happens if you just open an RTMS clinic in the community, take pretty much anyone who thinks they're depressed or whose GP thinks they're depressed, don't turn anybody away. This is the kind of numbers you're getting. And I'm not at all happy with those numbers. 20% is terrible, right? Uh, even if you've got responders up to uh, a total of around 45 to 50 percent remission, these numbers are not good enough and we need to fix that. So how do we fix that? Well, let's bring in a new kind of neuroscience. I talked about LTP and LTD. Now let's go to the neurobiology of what depression is about because there's a problem with almost every study that's been done. In 16 years and 100 studies or so since the first randomized controlled trials of depression in uh, the mid-1990s, the only areas that have ever been systematically studied as stimulation targets for RTMS are over there, the left and right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And I hope you can see from this view that that leaves 90% of the frontal lobes unexplored. This would be perfectly fine if we had unambiguous evidence that there's only one spot in the brain that is the central committee for depression and that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the place where depression happens. But the imaging tells us something very different. Is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex really the best target for RTMS and major depression? Well, back in the 1990s, we thought that it was pretty central to it. Nowadays, we don't look at the brain activity simply in terms of which areas are up or down. Uh, if you look at functional MRI scans of people, you can see that brain activity decomposes nicely into about 12 resting state networks. So if I were to scan your brain for 10 minutes, what I see is these 10 different networks all taking turns to come on and off in a sort of visible mental conversation. Uh, which is why I talk about depression not so much as a chemical imbalance, but when a patient asks me what depression is, usually I'll use the following analogy, that uh, the, the brain is a network of wiring pathways, very much like the city of Toronto is a network of streets. And upon that network can be run different patterns of traffic. And on a city like Toronto, you'll see different patterns of traffic. Anyone ever taken those little Google Maps where they show you where the traffic patterns are? What if you ran a sped up version of that all week long? you could actually see Toronto oscillating between different patterns of activity. One would be called morning rush hour. The other would be called afternoon rush hour. There'd be one that shows up once a week called cottage traffic. There'd be another one that shows up on game days. It would be called game day with a different pattern going on. And a healthy city needs to oscillate between all these different patterns in order to get all its functions done. What if one or two of those networks banded together and just gummed everything up? So what if morning rush hour turned on and stayed there for 18 hours a day? you'd have a dysfunctional city. So depression is a network problem. That's what depression looks like. It's one or two networks banding together and taking over the activity of the brain so that they're dominating much more than the other areas should be. And one of the key nexuses, one of the hubs where these networks band together in depression but not in others is this area called the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex with the very unwieldy acronym DMPFC. Not DLPFC, DMPFC, the dorsomedial. They're calling it a dorsal nexus in depression because three of the biggest networks in the brain, the so-called default mode network, 
which is active any time people are out of the present moment and ruminating on the past or the future. If any of you are tuned out in the last few minutes from what I'm saying, that was your default mode on right there. Um, an executive network involving cognitive control, and a third network involved in the generation of somatic markers, the bodily feelings, which are why we call emotions feelings in the first place. They band together, they get glued and stuck together so that ruminations generate way more affect than they're supposed to. Cognitive control becomes pulled into this affect, becomes pulled into the ruminations, and what you've got is this, this sort of triple unholy alliance of networks taking over the brain and preventing other patterns of activity from coming in. So we've got to break that network somehow, and, and the trick is to somehow alter the activity of the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. What does it do? Well, that area seems to actually have a broader role. It's not a happy button. It's a self-control mechanism. Self-control of movements activates this area. Self-suppression of emotional responses, people who are good at this have more gray matter in that area. Self-cessation of pathological behaviors, impulses like loss chasing and pathological gamblers. When pathological gamblers inhibit their ability to loss chase, when they walk away from the table, they activate this area. In bulimia nervosa, when you present them with food cues, they show less activation than healthy controls in this area. So self-control seems to be involved in it. What's neat is it also shows up across many psychiatric disorders. It's thinned out in major depression compared to healthy controls. Gray matter is also thinned out there in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. The gray matter is also thinned out there in OCD, and it's also thinned out in PTSD. All completely different disorders, and overall the patterns of brain activity associated with each are very different, but they do have a common element. And I think it's just because the DSM is the, is the collecting ground for all brain disorders where people lose control of their thoughts, behaviors, and emotions. So if, you, if, you can't if you're a neurologist and you can't relate to why your patient's doing this bizarre stuff, uh, and you send them to the psychiatrist because they're, they can't snap out of it, or they're out of control, or they're just acting in strange ways. An Ill inability to, to regulate, to self-regulate your thoughts, your behaviors, your emotions is a common element across many psychiatric disorders, and I think that's why this area keeps popping up again and again and again, even though the disorders themselves are very different. So this dorsomedial prefrontal cortex is a so-called cortical locus of self-control. It's an anatomical locus of self-control. Totally useless information for a psychiatrist, of course. Unless, of course, you have a therapy that can be targeted directly at it. If you do medications or therapy, you don't need to know any of this stuff. You can't make your CBT just go there. You can't make your risperidone or your, or your fluoxetine just go there. But I can make an RTMS coil just go there. So this is what we started doing when we first opened the clinic. We said, well, let's forget about the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We want to get more activity, activations. Notice it was there, right? So if I go back to this area here, if you look on the side there, you see the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex on the sides of the left image there. It is wired into the dorsomedial, so it's not completely unconnected, but it's a side street fading, feeding into this main nexus. And what our idea was is let's target the nexus rather than trying to get there indirectly through the side street. So doing that requires a special uh, coil, which was just invented, uh, I guess, about three years ago. It's bent, so it makes a deeper penetrating field. You apply the stimulation to, under MRI guidance to the scalp point about here, and so you're blanketing this area with deep stimulation. Under MRI guidance, this is uh, Dr. Umar Dar, and there's Vanity pretending to be a patient. And uh, so we've got the MRI loaded up. We've got a camera following where things are. He's tracing the head out carefully, putting lots of points out, and so the camera can see the three-dimensional shape of the head, match it up to the MRI. And by the time you do all of this rigmarole, which takes about five minutes, you've now got a lock on the patient's head and on the coil, so I can place the coil over any desired target region to an accuracy of about two millimeters or so. The coils themselves generate fields that are the size of the bottom of a coffee cup, and the target areas are the size of a toonie. So you're trying to park a coffee cup on a toonie, and that really two millimeter accuracy is way overkill for that sort of thing. Uh, but nonetheless, we do it because we want to be precise. When we did this, obviously we hoped that dorsomedial stimulation would be way, would be as good as ECT. It would fix everybody because this is much more connected to depression. It turns out that's not what happened at all. So it wasn't way better. But something more interesting happened. We noticed that some patients got way better and improved, and other patients got nothing at all, and there wasn't a lot of middle ground. So when I plotted a bell curve to show what percentage improvement are my patients happening, the bell curve looked weird. It actually was two bell curves. So there was a pile of people over here between 50 and 100% improvement. We called them our responder pile. And then we have another group over here, our non-responder pile. 
Now, whenever you do anything in science and you apply a certain treatment, let's say you apply some solvent to a chemical sample and you get two bands that come out of it, that means your original sample had more than one thing in it. So this heterogeneous disorder we call major depression probably wasn't just one kind of patient. From a neuroanatomical perspective, you've got one group of people where stimulating the circuit makes them better, another one where stimulating the circuit does absolutely nothing. And that's why I've plotted out the, Im the improvement separately. So a, a mean and a standard deviation are only meaningful summary statistics on a unimodal distribution. So bimodal distribution, I have to plot two lines. So you've got 49% of people who are non-responders. And the nice thing is we're nudging the numbers up a little bit. So now we're getting 43% remitters here. It's better than 20. It's not perfect. It's still not ECT, but it's definitely a whole lot better than 20% remitters. But what's the difference between these folks? Is there a difference between the responders and non-responders? I couldn't find anything on the standard stuff. Age didn't predict. Gender didn't predict. Duration of episode, number of previous medication trials, number of previous episodes, none of this stuff seemed to predict outcome. You had to go down to the individual scales, the individual items on the scales, and then out of all of them, only three popped out after you performed the Bonferroni correction for the 155 different variables we checked. But three of them actually survived that ferocious multiple comparisons correction. Pessimism, loss of pleasure, and general interest. So this is an anhedonia cluster. And that's interesting because anhedonia has also been shown as a negative predictor of outcome in some medication trials and elsewhere. And so, so one of these two cardinal symptoms of depression, the thing we call anhedonia, at least for the purposes of dorsal medial simulation, seems to be somewhat predictive. What was neat was while I was doing this, uh, Joe Garacci, who used to be with our lab, was, was crunching the neuroimaging numbers. And he went on a nexus hunt through the brain and said, well, do they all have a dorsal nexus? And what it turned out was not all patients have a dorsal nexus. Some of them have a ventral nexus in the place we weren't stimulating, down here in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, right smack in the middle of the brain's reward circuitry. And this is what healthy reward circuitry is supposed to look like. You can see a sort of Orion's belt sign where these three areas are coactive. Our responders who had preserved hedonic symptoms, their reward circuitry looked like it had normal connectivity. So it actually looked like it was still okay. They were depressed, but they actually still had some hedonic tone and the circuit was intact. Our non-responders, the hedonic tone was all messed up. In fact, the motivational circuitry is tailing right back down here into the subgenual cingulate cortex. So the neuroimaging and the clinical results uh, agreed that these areas were, um, that these areas were, uh, sorry, that these patients uh, were somewhat distinct. It also generates a hypothesis, which is if you drill down and put a stimulator here, in an area that I can't get to with a coil yet, but uh, Andres Lozano and Peter Jacobi and uh, the neurosurgical and psychiatric team there, they can get stimulators down there. And here's what happens, I'm, I'm borrowing from one of their papers here, when you put a stimulator in and you start stimulating, even though it's a stimulator, it actually is more like a jamming effect on that area of the circuit. So what you actually get is inhibition, which is why it's blue on that PET scan there. So you're blasting inhibition all the way through this reward circuitry, and this seems to be what's getting folks better. Uh, anecdotally, the anhedonic patients seem to do better with deep brain stimulation. So that's an important question for further investigation. Could it be that we've actually got two different flavors of depression, two ways to get depressed? A dorsal depression, which is more dysregulation, cluster B, impulse control issues, and a ventral depression, which is more dysthymic, anhedonic. And those are, the, are gonna require different types of stimulation because the circuitry underlying them is somewhat different. So that's what we think is going on. Now I got interested, since we've got this second area we're simulating, I said, okay, well, we've got this three minute result where we think that three minute simulation is just as good as 38 minute simulation, but that would be really important if it's true. So let's, let's pretend that maybe it isn't true. Let's see if that's also true in the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. Is theta burst three minute simulation just as good as the long conventional simulation at this other area in the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex? So this summer I had, oh, there, there she is, Saba Shahab went through all of the, uh, char she did a comprehensive chart review on 185 people who came through and uh, 98 of them got conventional 10 hertz stimulation for a long period of time and another 87 of them had gotten theta burst. Not a randomized control trial, not the same level of evidence, but we, ran them, we did run them concurrently. We were not able to find any demographic predictors one way or the other, because we were just treating both groups with, with both types of stimulation simultaneously. We never actually went through and compared the outcomes head to head until this summer. But here's where they started on the Hamilton in the two groups, statistically indistinguishable, and here's where they ended up on the Hamilton. 
also statistically indistinguishable. And if you'd like to see that as a graph over time, well, we also plot it that way. So here it is on the Hamilton in the back, and it's the same deal. So it doesn't matter whether you're in the 10 hertz group or the three minute group, the theta burst group, the outcomes are essentially indistinguishable on HamD. And on the back, if anything, they're trending towards being slightly better with the three minute treatment. There wasn't a statistical difference there. Now again, these are uni this only works for unimodal distributions, right? I've got means and standard deviations there. In reality, what we see is we see a multimodal distribution. So I had to go and do another type of comparison called a uh, cumulative distribution function, where you literally plot every single patient's percent improvement in a rank fashion. So you take every patient, rank how much they improve, and then draw a curve of that rank, and then you do the same thing for the other group as well. You can compare the two curves. And so there you can spot subtle differences where even if the means and standard deviation is different, there might be little bulges here and there where certain groups are doing better than others. But we couldn't find that either. So here's the curve for theta burst and the curve for 10 hertz. And again, these are statistically indistinguishable. So we could not find any difference between the three minute and the 10 minute. So I'm reasonably comfortable now telling people that all this time we've been spending doing 38 minute sessions, you actually don't need it. This is really good news. You can get away with a three minute session. The outcomes are just as good. Shown it for the conventional target and dorsolateral. Same thing seems to be true for this new UHN target we have in dorsomedial. And so I'm reasonably comfortable saying that we can make RTMS way cheaper and way higher volume, and that's going to have tremendous system-wide impact. It also opens up another possibility. When RTMS is a 38-minute treatment, then by the time you've given somebody one session, it's pretty much they're tired and they want to go home. But what if it's only three-minute treatment? Then the patient gets out of the exchange and says, what, that's it? So I go home now? It took me two hours to drive down here. Could we do it again? What if we did it five times a day? What if we did it 10 times a day? So the question becomes, and this is what we're going to do a trial on next. Uh, so Cam H and UBC and our clinic and the one over at Queens, we've all teamed together to do a big end trial where we're going to start looking at accelerated protocols. What happens, and there are people who have done this before, other studies elsewhere have got anecdotally some success where they've given people up to 10 sessions a day. Some of them have reported full improvement in a third of the patients in as little as two days. Uh, to me, that sounded a little extreme. But we have treated about 25 patients with accelerated treatment here over the last few years. And what we find is that, again, the response and remission rates seem comparable. But in the responders, when they do get better, they get better in four to 10 days. So it does look possible to do this. First person we ever tried this on, uh, the bipolar seemed to switch a little more quickly. So this person came in with a back of 37 on Monday morning. Here's Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, and Saturday morning. So that's remission in nine days. Even ECT doesn't do that. So that was kind of neat. Another case, some of you were here for this person. This, this was actually a physician who was admitted uh, to our hospital, I, I guess, a few years ago uh, and was, had severe depression back of 54. Um, and had declined ECT because of concern over cognitive side effects. So we treated this person, and again, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So by Friday, we knocked them down to 27. So 27 points off the back in five days. Uh, but still pretty depressed, so we just brought them back, and we did this again five times a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And by the time we were done on the end of the second week, this person was down to a back of 10. I'm not going to claim this works for everybody, but it does look like RTMS doesn't have to be a six-week course of treatment. Uh, there are now several groups that have found this for dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We're doing it for dorsomedial. A trial will be coming up. The other thing no one's really looked at is why are we choosing? If it's a three-minute treatment, give dorsomedial, give dorsolateral, give the parietal, just strike every area that's involved in the network associated with depression. If you're trying to untangle a traffic jam, why would you pick just one intersection to start unravel? Or you're trying to untangle a knot, why would you start at just one end? It may be that rather than looking for a complex biomarkers and trying to predict who should get this side, who should get that side. We use the approach they use in HIV or in, uh, tr in quadruple therapy for, uh, for H. pylori, which is, yeah, I could genotype all your H. pylori bacteria and find the one antibiotic, or I could just give you four of them, and, just, and two or three of them will do it. Likewise for HIV, if we tried to genotype and sequence everybody's HIV virus plus their genome to figure out what their liver was up to and then find the one perfect antiretroviral form, no, we don't do that. We'd pick four antiretrovirals, we'd give them all. It's just, it's just easier this way. We just want to, we want to resolve. Accelerated RTMS opens up the possibility of doing it that way. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to nudge our numbers up even further as well as make it a quick treatment. What I'm hoping is that RTMS and maybe we'll do this work here, and certainly we'll do this work here in Canada, and probably we'll do a lot of it here at UHN. But five years from now, RTMS could be a thing we use on the inpatient unit a lot, treating many, many different areas, getting people better in five to 10 days, something you could even fly into Toronto for the week for, get it done, and then fly back to Timmins or some other site where you're a little too far away to get the treatment. So 
this is all a pipe dream. We'd like to make RTMS that powerful so it can just take on everything. Uh, but I will present to you some, it may, it may not be able to be sort of the invincible destroyer of all of the enemies of Thor, but it could potentially treat other disorders as well. All of this stuff we discovered by accident. The very second patient, we, and this, we found this, I, I think most of our treatments in psychiatry, if we look at them, may, many more of them have been found by happy accident than by targeted hypothesis driven investigation. And if you want happy accident, what you really do is just try and, and not rule anything out and keep your eyes open. So when we were treating people, we made a point of not turning too many people away. I'm not saying we did this based on principle. Essentially, we, were just, we didn't like the idea of sending people away, and we were hungry for data. And so we said, well, let's just treat everybody who comes to the door. We're not going to worry about comorbidities. We'll treat everyone. And we're not going to have any preconceived notion about the fact that your eating disorder means it's not going to work, or your borderline personality means it's not going to work, or your or your alcohol issues, maybe it's not going to work, or your PTSD. All of these folks were getting excluded from the randomized control trials done traditionally in RTMS. But we said, let's treat everybody and see what happens. It's a new brain area. Who knows? The very second patient we treat, not 1,001, but patient number two, had depression as well as bulimia nervosa. Many of you will have heard of this case. Uh, she'd had a 20-year history of binging and purging. Uh, and we treated her for her depression. She told us two or three weeks in that after 20 years, her binging and purging, she no longer had the urge to do it at all. And that result lasted for two and a half months after treatment. The only thing that had worked for her in the past was admission for symptom interruption. And typically, after she went home from that, the effects would last about four or five days. Have I got that right? Yeah, about four or five days. I'm just looking at Pat there. She, she, uh, she, she had a stem that. So, Variable effects in this. It doesn't work in everybody, but it did make sense because, as I showed you before, in bulimia nervosa, this area seems to be underactive. So we've recently submitted a paper where we did this in 30 more people. And again, we don't quite get a bimodal response. It's very funny. What happens if you look at the improvement? You get a pile of people over here who improve, but then you get this other tail of people down at the other end who actually get substantially worse with the treatment. Um, and so it's and so it really the question is, is RTMS really doing the same thing to everybody? And the only way to look at that is to go back to the brain imaging. So we found out that yes, there's this key circuit between this dorsal nexus area we stimulate. And I told you RTMS works through those corticostriatal <laughs> loops. Uh, so it turns out that if you look, there's a circuit of functional connectivity between the striatum and this area here. And if it's missing, so in healthy controls, it's present. And in certain patients, it is missing. So there's a lack of correlation. So these, the activity of these series is not correlated. They're not communicating with one another. In those patients, you perform 10 hertz RTMS, and all of a sudden, the connectivity is restored, and they get better. But there are some patients where when you scan them, the funny thing is that that circuit doesn't look broken. It's actually already intact. So they're the ones who don't get better. In fact, to make the matters even worse, when you give them 10 hertz stimulation, which everyone supposedly knows is excitatory, and all the classical textbooks say is excitatory, um, it actually makes them worse. It kills off the circuit and makes them worse. So what RTMS does to you probably has to do with what your circuit is like to start with. And we probably need to know more about what our patient's connectivity is before we can predict what the RTMS is going to do to them. So this is sort of a breakthrough on a couple of different fronts. First of all, that we've got a predictor that suggests whether it's worth doing RTMS. And second of all, that we have to be careful that all the textbooks tell us that a certain pattern is supposed to do one thing, but in reality, Individual patients are not all the same, and they respond to a given pattern in quite markedly different ways. This also turned out to be true when we went back and looked in depression. So when we go to our depression patients, we look at the connectivity there, same thing, corticostriatothalamic circuits. If you're missing, if it's blue, so lack of connectivity, if you go in missing connectivity in that circuit, so it's not synchronized up, you're going to get better. In patients where that's not the issue, where they're not missing connectivity there, you apply the stimulation and it doesn't do much for them. So they weren't getting worse in the case of depression, but they just weren't getting better. So it was the same thing. It looks like regardless of whether it's eating disorders or depression, again, it's not so much an antidepressant effect. What the RTMS is doing when it's working is strengthening the corticostriatal connectivity through this area involved in self-regulation of thoughts, behaviors, and emotions. And when we do that, we're fixing a variety of stuff. The depression gets better. The, uh, the impulsive uh, behaviors get better. The bulimia nervosa gets better. Um, and as I showed you, there are lots of other disorders that also implicate this. And OCD was one of them. So in answer to the question, do other disorders respond to dorsomedial? Well, here's the OCD results. So this is a volumetric study done a few years ago where they showed that this area is thinned out. And this other area, which was part of the seed I showed you, and ventral striatum is thickened in OCD. So you get this pattern where these areas have grown some gray matter and these areas have lost some gray matter. And it's in the same area we stimulated. 
Well, as we started treating our eating disorder patients, about one out of three of them has obsessive compulsive disorder, and a lot of them started telling us their OCD was getting better. Now there, the results were really bimodal. So we've just submitted, we've just fought, we're in the process of submitting this paper in the next week or so. Um, if I plot the percent Y box improvement after 30 sessions of dorsomedial stimulation, we get a pile of responders over here, we get a pile of non-responders here, and th this is McDonald's bimodal. Like it's, it's really, you're really just getting sort of two very distinct piles here. And again, I'm going to present the results separately for the same reason we have these two populations. So if you could somehow figure out who your responders were, when responders respond, and these are people who are already medication and therapy refractory, going in with a Y box of 30 out of 40 points. This is not mild OCD. This isn't a severe range. Board verging onto anything 32 or above is reckoned to be extreme. So these are pretty tough, these are pretty tough cases. And they're getting 67% improvements. Most clinical trials in OCD, if you get a 30% improvement, they'll actually call that response. So if you're a responder, you're going to respond a lot. If you're a non-responder, it's not that you're sick or you don't go in with any, and we couldn't find any clinical differences between responders and non-responders on demographic data symptomatology. But non-responders just not doing a whole heck of a lot. Doesn't seem to be making them worse, just not doing a whole heck of a lot. So let's go to the fMRI and figure out, is it doing the same thing? So we thought, well, let's go and look at this. Let's look at that circuit again. Let's look at the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex and how it connects to that other region there that I showed you, the, this ventromedial prefrontal or sorry, this ventral striatum here. Same circuit we're seeing in all the other disorders. Uh, and we think that we're supposed to be strengthening that circuit to get people better from OCD. Now here's the funny thing, that's actually the opposite of what we saw. In the setting of OCD, it's patients who had stronger connectivity here associated with their OCD symptoms that were getting better responses. And the more we were able to reduce on the uh, horizontal axis here, the more we were able to reduce your connectivity, sorry, let me move forward with that. The more we were able to reduce your connectivity leftward on here, the more likely you were to get better. That, so there's your seed region, that's your ventral striatum, and there's its connectivity. So the more you're able to, blank, to bring down the activity of this circuit between these two areas, the more you seem to attenuate the OCD symptoms. This was a bit of a jaw dropper for us because just earlier this year, a different group had used deep brain stimulation, implanting deep brain stimulator electrodes in the other end. So we're stimulating the top end of this circuit. Uh, the neurosurgeons are implanting down here. They're putting stimulators in the deep parts of this circuit. And what they found was that what predicted the effect was that just anterior to this, pretty much the same dorsolateral region. So whether you're going to get better or not depended on how high your connectivity was through the very same area. Now, I need to flip the axis because they, they put negative going right versus the left. But if you'll let me flip the axis around, you'll see it's exactly the same pattern here. So when DBS is fixing OCD, it looks like it's fixing it the same way we're fixing it. Now, does that mean that all these people who have deep brain stimulators in their heads could have got away with having non-invasive brain stimulation? I'm not sure no one's done that study. But what it does look like is when we do dorsomedial stimulation for OCD, we are fixing them by affecting the same circuit. The patients that we're, fi we're fixing have the same ingoing pathology of overconnectivity in this circuit, and the extent to which we fix them correlates to how much we're able to attenuate that. A common mechanism discovered independently for RTMS and for OCD. So again, we're really nailing this. Now, by the way, the patients love this. When you show this to them, they all think that it's their fault that you know, the parents didn't bring them upright or something like that. When you show them that there's a specific circuit that's just overactive and that we're trying to t attenuate and bring it down, you, you, actually, you actually see the relief on their faces when they know, okay, I didn't do this. It's not my fault. It just something went wrong in my brain and maybe there's a way to put it right again. So they actually find this, this surprisingly technical scientific data, they find it to be somewhat sort of therapeutically useful for them. They also give us great stories. So one of our patients sent us a video blog where she, she had severe contamination fear. She couldn't even put her bag on the floor of the room while she was being treated. Uh, she would open the, <laughs> And here she is showing us this. There are probably a few people in this room who have trouble doing this, holding onto the subway <laughs> pole. After a day of being absolutely OCD defeated, I pull off this stunt for the first time in several years. Look, no sweater wrapped hand or napkin, and some random guy's hand is pretty much making out with mine. <laughs> or at the very least flirting. She had a great sense of humor. So she actually made a full recovery. We had to bring her back for a few booster sessions, but she did ultimately recover. And she went back to her work as a teacher. And she was ultimately able to eat the birthday cake her little kids made her in the school without being faced with, their kids made her a birthday cake. And she was able to eat the cake without being crippled by contamination fears. So really nice outcome there. This is all awesome. But again, I'm trying to make this faster, cheaper, more accessible. How are you going to do this? In, 
Timmins, how are you going to do this in Bob Cajun? How are you going to do this in some location where there's no MRI scanner? Do we really need an MRI for every patient? Well, I've been talking about MRI guided, and we make a big deal of calling it the MRI guided RTMS clinic because when we first started it, we thought that would be really important. It's got to be MRI guided because if it's not MRI guided, you get this. The standard way of doing it is the thing called the five centimeter rule. You find the motor cortex area that moves the thumb. You get out a measuring tape. You measure five centimeters anteriorly. If anyone can tell me what anteriorly means on a curved surface, I don't know. Uh, but here's what happens when you do that. This is where the coil ends up across about 30 people. It's all over the frontal lobes, and we know that about one third of the time you end up in premotor cortex, which has no mood regulating effects whatsoever, and the treatment doesn't work. So the five centimeter rule is inaccurate, scatters all over centimeters and centimeters of frontal lobe. And that's why we went to MRI-guided stimulation. So there's a nice MRI-guided simulator, making sure that you're over the proper target region. Now enter a new kind of measurement called beam F3. F3 is an EEG location, so when you stick a montage of EEG electrodes, they all have numbers and letters associated with them. The one that's pretty much over dorsal lateral is called F3. And uh, there was a clever group down in Boston that was able to come up with a method where they, they did some calculations and measurements. And what they said is, just give us three things. And they actually made it into a nice software program that's online and free for anybody to use, which is kind of cute. So um, you enter three things. The distance from the tragus to tragus of the ear over the top of the head, the circumference around the top of the head, and the nasian and inian distance, so from the front to the back of the head. You enter those three numbers, and it will immediately pop out and say, OK, start here, measure 6.5 centimeters this way, make a dot. Now start from the top of the head of the vertex and measure this number of centimeters and make a dot, and that's where you go. So that was kind of neat. No MRI, just enter some numbers into a computer program and spit it out. But how accurate is that? Now there's a bar here, because when I do MRI guided, I said there's a wiggle room of two or three cent millimeters in the calibration. And even once you've calibrated, there's a wiggle room of operator error, which is usually around two millimeters or so. So you look at it. Even with the best neuro navigating, and we can get you pretty close, but five millimeters is pretty small for a coil this big. And so you really, five millimeters is about as close as we can get. So one of our awesome summer students, Arsalan, spent all summer loading up 100 MRIs of people who we'd given dorsolateral. And he did this in the computer software. It was really an unfree, it took like an hour to do each one. He had to go and trace this on the person's MRI and then measure the dot and figure out exactly where the dot would have been using the beam F3 rule. And then he measured the distance from there to the M where we would have put it using the MRI. So he looked at what's the difference between where we've been putting it thanks to the MRI and where a beam F3 would have put us. And I thought we'd be within you know, two or three centimeters or something like that. But the, the news was actually way better than that. I have great, so distances across here. Here's the 100 patients all the way across here, ranked from closest to furthest away from the target. Five millimeters is here. So 45% of the patients are actually within five millimeters using BMF3. So about as good as you would have done with, with fMRI guided. Um, and if you look here, 90% of your patients are within 1.3 centimeters of the target. That's 95% of them here. 75% of your patients are here are under a centi so are under a centimeter. So if you do beam F3, you're going to land within a centimeter of the target in 75% of your patients. And remember, it's a coffee cup over a toonie. So a centimeter here and there may be good enough for our purposes. So that was pretty exciting. So this result, uh, we're, we're, again, we're going to submit this for publication in the next month or two. Uh, this result would mean that maybe you actually have a pretty decent rule, one that's already out there and published, and one that gets you within the target without nece the necessity for the, FM, for the uh, MRI. So that's dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. For dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, we had taken in the clinics using a thing called the 25% rule, because we noticed that whenever we made the little dot on the person's head with the MRI guidance system, it was always exactly 25% of the distance from their nasium to their inion. It was always really, really close to 25%. So we tried out a 25% rule for this one. Now, with dorsomedial navigation, it's even easier because two out of three directions have already been taken care of. It's already got to be on the midline. And human beings are good at symmetry. So even, with a, even using your eyeball, you're actually pretty good at getting a dot symmetrically on the person's head. Uh, as for coil orientation, this way or that way, that's already taken care of. It's along the midline. So I've taken care of left, right. The only parameter left is forward, back. How far back do I put it on the nasian inian line? 
And so if we use the 25% rule, actually it turns out it's the 25.8% rule. In this case, Arcelon didn't do 100 MRIs. Uh, I kept pestering for more MRIs, so finally he disappeared for a week. Well, I disappeared for a week. I came back from holiday, and he said, I knew you were going to ask me for more, so I did 150. And then I knew you were going to ask me for more, so I did 200. And then over the weekend, I figured you might even ask me for more, so I took it up to 230. So he did 230 MRIs. So 230 patients who had dorsomedial stimulation, and were actually even better. So if five millimeters is as good as you're going to get with neuronavigated, fully 50% of our patients are within that range just using scalp measurements in the 25.8% rule. And in this case, 90% of your patients are within a centimeter. So, and remember, in this case, the field is big and the area we're stimulating is quite deep. So even if you move a few ways this way or that way, it's like you're shining onto a target radially from different angles. So a few millimeters one way or other, you're probably getting the target. So what we think is that it will be almost certainly possible to put the coil in the right place for dorsomedial uh, stimulation with even greater accuracy than you get for dorsolateral stimulation. Do we need MRI guided? Should we paint out that bit on the wall? Arguably, we should maybe just paint out the MRI guided bit. We don't need it for neuronavigation. In a pinch, you can get away without it. That's potentially good news on the inpatient unit. That's potentially good news in peripheral clinics that don't have access to uh, scanners. And certainly good news for the patients who don't have to wait around for a scan before they can proceed with their treatment. <sighs> All right, so to wrap up in the last two minutes, fMRI still could be useful. We always do two scans when we send someone for, uh, for RTMS. The first is the structural scan, the T1 scan. The other is the functional MRI. Okay, so fine, maybe we don't need the, fun the structural MRI, but what about that? Is the functional MRI also a waste of time? Could it be possible to predict outcomes in individual patients from functional MRI? Now, again, Joe Garacci, who was our PhD mathematician, he spent a lot of time trying to do, build automated uh, machine intelligence learning algorithms to try and predict outcomes and uh, we notice again and again in this field, the more we try and be clever, the less we get from it. It turns out, that, I hope you've seen the, the, the theme here, which is we try to be clever, and then it turns out the cleverness gets you nothing, and the simpler solution is actually just as good as the clever solution. So after getting reasonably good accuracies, about 85 90% using uh, the most sophisticated mach machine learning methods we can come up with, I asked Katie to just go back to the original scans, drop a seed in that ventral striatum region, which kept popping up. Remember, they keep, remember how it kept showing up for depression, OCD, everything else. So let's drop a seed there and let's look at the connectivity patterns. And let's assume that you don't have a PhD in neuroimaging and just blue is anti-correlated and red is correlated. And show me my five worst outcomes. Non-responder, 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 non-responder. And look in the subgenual, little blue dot, little blue dot, little blue dot, little blue dot, little blue dot. There's a non-responder scan. If you have a scan that looks like that, you're not going to get better. Notice overactivity going in, so you've got that overactivity. So it looked like it wasn't working for these folks. All right, show me my five best outcomes. Responder, 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 responder. So far looking so good. And then the fifth one, <laughs> not so good, except except that when we actually looked up who this person was, I recognized the name immediately because this is somebody who had come in uh, and she had a, a case of bipolar disorder with rapid cycling, but she was only ever bipolar too. So I treated her and her numbers looked great and by the end her back was, was in the single digits. And so I brought her in and I expected her to be very happy and tell me what a great experience it had been. And she said, I'm never doing RTMS again. And I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, in the last three weeks, I have spent $5,000 of money I don't have. I'm not sleeping. I slept with my best friend. My husband's about to leave me. Um, I'm way out of character. I've never been like this before. We had pushed her into hypomania. So oddly enough, the scan was right and the back was wrong. This it was actually a terrible outcome for this patient. So reliabilities on this, we're going to find out. We've got to run this on a lot more people and see. But it may be possible with reasonable accuracy to see distinct patterns just by visual inspection of the scans in individual patients and predict outcomes. That's never been done anywhere in medicine. No one's ever been able to predict a treatment outcome off of just visually inspecting a scan for any disorder anywhere. So if we find this, that could turn out to be something really good. Why is it possibly so clean? Because 
RTMS doesn't need to go through your liver or your serotonin receptors or your genome to get there. It's just targeting a specific brain area and tweaking it up. So there's a lot fewer intervening variables between what the intervention is and what the brain is. So it might be one of these things where we're looking at brain activity for SSRIs or other things. Hopefully it'll work, but there's lots of intervening variables. You may need to bring in, as Dr. Kennedy is with the CanBind, you may also need to take into account genomic and proteomic and structural information. But for plain old boring, plain vanilla RTMS, where you're just hitting the brain region directly with stimulation, it might be that we could get away with the scans alone. All right, what does the future of brain stimulation look like? Hopefully not like that. But I do think that pretty soon we're going to be up to 10 or 15 medical appointments, 25 to 50 sessions per day per device. So every device can treat you up to 200 patients a year. That would be fantastic. Viable operations at $40 per session or $1,200 per course. We've submitted this to OHIP. So uh, CAMH's folks, Jeff Daskalakis, Dan Bloomberger, and I sent off an application to OHIP. Uh, we made it to the Ontario Health Technology Assessment Committee, and they have agreed to do one of their two or three assessments a year that they do. We're going to find out on November 28th whether they made a positive recommendation. Uh, so far, the jurisdictions in Canada fund RTMS. Quebec funds it. Saskatchewan funds it. Alberta went through their version of this, and they generated a positive report April 28th of 2014 saying, yes, fund it. So they're going to be building a network of clinics starting next year. We're hoping we get the right response from, uh, from, uh, from Ontario. And the fact that we have uh, UHN's own Bob Bell there in the deputy minister's office, we're hoping they work in our favor. He's, he's, he's become quite a fan of RTMS. Um, but I'd like to do better than that. I'd like to get the course length down to five to 10 days. So that's our next up project. We're going to see if we can get that done. Maybe we can get a stimulator in the inpatient unit and start to plug away at that. Uh, it would also, not just inpatient, you could imagine a boot camp version of RTMS where you bring people in for a week of an, if you're going to be there all day, why sit in the food court between sessions? Why not bring in some CBT therapists, occupational therapists? Why not do a medication consult? Why not do it all? Depression boot camp. You're in here, take two weeks off work, we're going to give you RTMS and we're going to give you a crash course in mindfulness. Uh, we're going to give you uh, social work, occupational therapy. We should do it all while we have the person there anyway. So that's a different model of approaching things. Um, and the targeting does appear to be possible without the fMRI, without the MRI, which is good news for the community. But fortunately for me, MRI may not be a complete waste of time. It may be possible to do outcome prediction if you do want to take the extra time and expense of doing functional MRI. And given that a $250 scan, if it's about 85% reliable and giving you yay or nay on a $1,200 course, it does make economic sense to do the scan prior to doing the treatment. All right, we're at 101. So thanks for your attention. It was a huge data dump. Sorry for throwing everything at once, but I did want to cover everything we've done in the last three years. Thank you also. I want to conclude by thanking everybody. Uh, I think we have the entire RTMS clinic. So Sunny is the person who actually fields all those 400 referrals a year. Uh, not many people can manage that, but so Sunny does that. Uh, we've got Vanity, our senior technician, Aisha Dar. Uh, Dr. Umar Dar and Dr. Sheila Brown over there. Terry Cairo uh, running all the paperwork. It's a chart's worth of paperwork for every single patient who comes through for each one of our clinical trials. So she's been running things here. Um, who else? Was, so Saba, who did all the work on, on the chart review of 185 patients. I don't think we have Arsalan here today. Uh, Eileen, who has been uh, working on the eating disorder study and finding the clinical parameters and tracking how our patients are doing in the eating disorder study. So uh, there's, it, it's a team of about 15 people who are making all this stuff happen. Uh, and I just get to be the guy who sort of presents all of their hard work. So thank you so much for everything you've done. Cheers.